Hello, everyone. Welcome to this year's 2023 International Euphonium Summit with my special guest, Micah Dominic Parsons. Uh, he started his musical life playing the B-flat cornet at the Salvation Army in Coventry, quickly making the move to the euphonium at the age of 14. Mike has been privileged to make a number of guest soloist appearances in England, Germany, and France, and currently holds the principal euphonium seat of the Brass Band of Central England, which is a championship section brass band based in the West Midlands. Now, for those in the U.S. who don't understand the uh, the geographical regions of uh, the U.K. and such, uh, I will leave a link below to have your heart's content at learning all the geography uh unless micah wants to part uh dive into that as well uh we did in the transcriptions a little bit beforehand so micah has also studied with a number of great euphonium virtuosos including stephen mead david childs and trevor groom graduated from the coventry university in 2015 with a first class honors degree in music he is a champion of new music, and that, that right there is an understatement, and has commissioned major new works from the pens of Bruce Broughton. Uh, did I say that right? Broughton? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Philip Harper, Paul Lovett, Cooper, Peter Meacham, Lucy Pankers, and more recently, Philip Spark. Now, has some really awesome stuff to come in. Eventually, y'all will understand why I say pretty awesome stuff, because I get to interview some of those two. Um, hint. Um, Mike has also collaborated with a number of instrument manufacturers, which has resulted in new products being specifically made for the euphonium, the most notable being the Strom V Maxi Clappers, adapted from the E-flat soprano cornet for the B-flat euphonium. What in the world? Uh, welcome to the stage. Welcome to the International Euphonium Summit. I almost dove right into a question that I've really wanted to understand. What in the world? Uh, welcome to the stage. Thank you for having me. Gunnar, you far away with your first yeah. question. What, 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 what's the uh, Stone V Maxi Clapper? So a Stone V Maxi Clapper, it's a really, really, really interesting design. Uh, first used on the Stomby Titan Soprano Corner. It's basically a large heavyweight with a, a fifth um, placed, a bell which is tuned to a fifth placed within the centre of the, the, the maxi clapper. Um, I'll try and get some photos across to you so, so we can share them and see what they look like. Absolutely amazing. They they really centre your sound and they just, just provide that bit of weight to the bottom of the instrument which just solidifies everything and just creates a more balanced even sound, especially when using the fourth valve. Huh. Does that work on a non-compensating as well? Um, yeah. Wow. That's intriguing. I'm definitely, uh, we'll dive into that. Uh, Mike has uh, been, uh, has honored us with uh, not just one interview, but he's agreed to come on again and go into, we're going to do some short sequences of these interviews uh, to see how that uh transpires and uh, works out over the uh, next however many years that the, this International Euphonium Summit actually runs uh, with these uh, podcasts, these uh, these uh, video uh, documents, uh, basically live documentaries of where we're at now in this world. Um, yeah, thank you for letting us know about that really quick and, and a proper welcome and thank you so much for coming on. No, thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute privilege to to be to to meet you and to to be part of this incredible project. I can't. I'm almost lost for words when describing how good it is to meet somebody who's as passionate as I am, and um, for for giving other euphonium players across the world opportunities. Absolutely, and you have some really exceptional opportunities as well, and you can read about them in the transcripts uh, that. Uh, go extensively over an hour of uh, amazing content and really some really special moments of um, of commonality between Micah and I uh, with our uh, backgrounds in for him supporting the military and my background in military and um, 
it's really intriguing getting to be part of that process of where he's at now and where he's been and where he's going. If you want to take a look at, or, I mean, we'll end up probably covering that at some point within um, the book or uh, these uh, interviews. And so I, I can't wait to like dive into the kind of the nuts and bolts back into the questionnaires where, you know, we get a, uh, bridge back into your past to where you are now. Yeah, so I guess where do we start? Starting at the start. So I, as yeah, you mentioned, euphonium, yeah, yeah. So I started on the corner at six. Although I was very much enamoured with music from a young age, and um, I had a corner. There's a picture of me at the age of three holding a corner, trying to play it. And there, there was also this insistence of getting my dad's. Uh, music folder out and his music and conducting the music on the stand at home. Uh, that must have been when I was two, three and four. Um, so uh, probably I, I probably always had an interest in music, but it took me a bit later. So when I was in a, a teenager to to really discover the euphonium and it, it came around because I wanted to play the drums, which is quite an odd story. So I wanted to play the drums and I, I was going to, after a short break from playing the corner, they agreed to let me play the drums if I would also play the euphonium within the Young People's um, Salvation Army Band in commentary. And so I was given a very uh, rusty Sovereign 967 euphonium and I took it home and never looked back. Um, it's, it never never played the drums, um, always the euphonium. So it... it for, for wanting to be a drummer, I sort of ended up as a euphonium player, which is quite interesting. That's that's it's usually trumpet to euphonium or or any other instrument than percussion. I've never heard uh I've yet to hear you're the first one I've heard that wanted to play percussion but was handed a euphonium. Yeah, I, it's I, I really don't know where it came from. I think it was all a ploy just to get me to agree to play the euphonium. Um, because I, I knew nothing about it, and I was lucky to have my dad who played the euphonium. Um, but in reality, I didn't know anything about the world when I was handed this euphonium at the age of 13, 14. Um, apart from that, it was big and it was gold. And I think pretty much from those formative days, I just fell in love with it. And it, it just almost snowboarded into, into this love for the euphonium, this passion for, for everything euphonium and music. and and playing a brass instrument. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you covered in uh, the written uh, transcripts beforehand. Um, what what was your? I mean, not not necessarily the initial drive of playing a musical instrument at three, because of you know thoughts of consciousness, right? Um, but mm -hmm. what what became the reason of playing a musical instrument? Uh, in that purpose in your first couple of years of just playing an instrument? So for me, my first real solid memory of really falling in love with the euphonium was at a, a youth band course uh, within the Salvation Army known as the Territorial Youth Band. And we had a visitor, David Charles, really well-known euphonium player. And I was sat down on second baritone. I'd been offered a place on the course last minute. And, I, you know, it, it, it's all been very last minute. And David Charles stood up and delivered a performance of The Hot Canary. And I never, ever heard anything like it. And it, it just made me fall in love with the euphonium, hearing this, the technique of, of David Charles and, and hearing this sonorous sound, this, this, this sound which gets into your, your heart and you... you it, you just can't get it out of your mind once you've heard it. It's just a sound that you instantly fall in love with. And and for me, that that's where my journey really began, that enthusiasm. And so that's really what got me practising um, every day. It got me looking at what future opportunities there were for the euphonium, what I could do with it. And uh, I think very quickly within within that period of time, I started taking lessons with, with the local orchestral um, euphonium player called Steve Cooper who used to play um, with the London Symphony Orchestra and he, you'll find him on all the videos of the last night of the proms playing the um, the famous uh, um, Fantasia on British Sea Songs 
and and he he was a huge support to me during during those formative years and i think being honest had a few setbacks in those in those first few years i probably started a year too late but actually those setbacks actually probably propelled me into being the euphonium player that i i am today and hopefully will be in the future absolutely so when did what opportunities did you see that uh, when you are looking at opportunities and when did you like, I guess it was David Childs's performance is when you first understood that it could be a career, but did you, at that moment, did you own that identity? Like that's what you wanted to do as a dream job at that moment? So at that moment, it was always just an interest on the side, I believe, um, looking back. Um, it was only really when I started taking lessons with Stephen Cooper and and then I went for lessons with David Charles um, and I began to see the opportunities opening up for me by attending the, the Territorial Youth Bank course, by by seeing the, the local opportunities from the music service, from being awarded a grant by, by the local music service and being given opportunities to perform in front of the Lord Mayor um, of Coventry. Um, but then gaining a proficiency in the euphonium which then allowed me to play for the local bands as well and when i when i started playing for, for sort of the local bands and I, my, my ability started to improve i started to see more of the opportunities for for education not only taking lessons with euphonium players actually playing in wind bands maybe i could fit the euphonium in with guitars and singers and and, and more what you'd probably define as a, a pop band and and then i saw you know the opportunities for education when when that time came by attending college by by following the trinity guild hall grade seven and grade eight and um, by being offered a place at university and being guided by some really proficient and, and knowledgeable professors um within the music industry while whilst it comes to uni and i think i must say it was probably the year maybe about 2012 where i started to really take playing the euphonium seriously and saw it as a potential option for the future, whether that was to become a military musician, whether that was to, to try and do some session musician work, whether that was to, to do teaching both private and within a school, and um, whether that was to, you know, join a, join a brass band and see where that, or even stuff like umpire bands. And, um, you know, the, the opportunities for me were, they, they were presented on a plate and saw the places I got to go were weird and wonderful um, during my first year at university, we travelled up to Scotland, which for those of you who don't know, the Midlands is pretty much in the centre of England. Scotland is like a five hour drive, six hour drive, a bit of a trek. And we went up six hours, did a gig and um, doing an umpire gig. And then we drove back six hours. And I was in university, having had no sleep over 24 hours in university at nine o'clock the next day, having done this gig, ready to ready to learn the next day. So the opportunities then sort of started to come to me that I started to research the different euphonium players backgrounds. So my favorite players at the time were Derek Kane of the ISB and David Charles, Stephen Mead and, um, and David Charles was still playing with Corey band. Gary Curtin was with fairies and then black dyke. And I used to follow what these players were doing. I'll get the biographies and I'd, I'd, I'd look down what they'd done and how they achieved the positions they're currently in. And then I'd send them messages. So I got in touch with Stephen Mead and, and David Charles. And I started to take lessons. So I taught lessons with, with Trevor Groom. And Stephen Mead became our eventual teacher. And um, but those those people presented me the opportunities um, and showed me that opportunities were there. But that opportunities would only be there if I had the drive, commitment, and consistency to seek those opportunities out. So diving into Stephen uh, Steve Cooper at the London Symphony Orchestra, um, you mentioned that that was the first instance of like uh, being introduced to some of their works, uh, artists' works, including mm. the first time you listen to Stephen Mead. What, uh, what principles or sayings did he have uh, in his lessons with you um, that you still use today? So for me, Stephen Cooper, used, he always used the analogy of cricket and he always used to say, breathe, 
wait, play. And it was all about this calming, this inner calm that he, he was teaching me. He was teaching me to deal with my nerves and to be consistent in the note production. Now, when he was at the London College of Music, he, he spent a lot of time just playing from a C to a G, long tones. And that's all he did for a year. And the teacher, what his teacher wanted him to develop the sound. And Steve was a realist, very realistic in his approach. Actually, one of my biggest supporters. And he was, he showed me so many ways of not only dealing with my nerves, but also dealing with these setbacks. He was the one teacher who was there during my lowest moments playing. So during times where things didn't go right, he was the one person who was there and pulled me through those situations. And I can't underestimate of having a value of the teacher of Steve Cooper, who had done it as an orchestral, travelled to Russia, done all these famous tracks, being a session musician, and then was teaching at a head of a department in a, a, a head of music in a private school. Um, he he was the one who taught me not only to handle nerves, but also how to deal with really bad moments, bad moments where you want to stop playing totally. And he he really there for me. Um, and actually still there for me now. We we we're still good friends. He he brought me on and he conducted the local band and I became his principal euphonium. He had me playing solos and um, well, the famous double acts that we did, we we did a solo a contest and I won the best soloist award and he he Steve Cooper was conducting. So that was that was always a good memory. Um, but yeah, one of one of my biggest confidants, one of my just a person I could talk about anything, a real good teacher. And I think the biggest thing about Steve, he always encouraged me to find other teachers and go for other lessons to expand my knowledge. And um, so he 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 had a really, really, really good baseline for, for me in my formative years. Huh. Let's dive more. I think that is uh, with what we were talking about and discussing or rather talking about uh, before we hit the record button on these is the first volume. Let's, let's look at, or rather the chapters, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah the formative years and what were those moments uh those low moments you were discussing just now are telling us about what were what were the ways that he coached you in processing those low moments so the the low moments which i experienced they they were blows they were blocks in in the line for my progression um so to say and at the time, they were absolutely gutting, but he came around my house. He he had the heart-to-heart the -heart with me, so he had the, that conversation saying, you've been turned down for maybe a position, you, you've not been successful here, but you are a good player. These are the things you can do. He he was he was getting to me to see um, this situation from another perspective. He was, he was sharing his moments of, you know, his low moments with me. He was really showing me that actually our world as a musician, we are going to have low moments and this is just the natural part of it. And if you give up now, then that will be a waste of everything you put work into. And he he really, um, I think the biggest thing he helped me with was sharing his experiences, knowing that I wasn't alone as a euphonium player, um, that I wasn't alone and that, this experience was happening to many other people and it happened throughout many years. And um, so he, he, that was, that was really, really positive for me. It really got me to stay past that situation. And he got me playing again. He played duets with me, got me, got my confidence back up and playing duets, showing me that I could play high and low and all the technical stuff got me thinking of those next goals, got me thinking about what my future was. And, um, you know, and without him, you know, it got me into university and, you know, Concha University got me into playing in different bands. He he presented opportunities for me following on from those low moments, which picked me back up. Um, and then they, those opportunities for playing with band opportunities, be a soloist, playing in a small quartet, doing doing lots of different things. 
I want to dive into something that's in the transcripts um, that's not part of the actual questionnaire and stuff like that. Because it falls into maybe it was Steve Cooper that offered this insight to where, where did you first learn that pieces of music were written not just with notes, but with intention, with a reason? So for me, that, that's a mixture a mixture of, of, of people um, who showed me that. So all my teachers, so Steve Cooper, I always, I always classified my teachers in regards to their style of, of teaching and their approach to music. Now, Steve Cooper was very much an orchestral musician. And so that was a very different style of playing. So we, we got rid of the vibrato, which were famous for in, in British brass bands. We had to play very straight. And the way we produced the sound was totally different. And the way we had to produce the, mo the, the emotion was, was more with our air, our airflow, and how we produce notes on our tongue and, and the, the inner mechanism. Whereas when I went for, for lessons with Stephen Mead, Stephen Mead would, would look at the bigger picture. You know, what does this, this piece of music, what does this section of this piece of music mean? And and he would use analogies. So, for example, a, a fast piece of music, you're being chased by, um, you're being chased by an individual when when there was no st given story to a piece of music. Or he would, he would get me thinking, so imagine you're with the most beautiful um, partner in the world. And and it, there could be the, um, the most random of things. It could be that... There were comedy moments with, with Steve where we'd, we'd just laugh and that section of music would just be the part where me and Steve laughed and I knew exactly how to play it. But it, it's, I think if I was to look at it really an analytically, at how to tell stories music, I have to go back to my, my father um, who was up every morning at 6am playing his new phone in for an hour and... He used to play hymn tunes, part of the Salvation Army band. Everything he played was was music with expression, with emotion. And I think growing up with that, there, there becomes something internal which you sort of pick up and, and, and that only gets built on when you go for lessons with Steve Cooper and with Steve Mead. And, and even David Charles, I remember working on him with, with the album Fantasy Brilliante and how each section had to be playful and how you could split each bar down to make each note interesting. And yeah, very different approaches, but but ones which I like to swap in and out of. So sometimes I'll take a, a Stephen Mead approach with a piece of music, especially with lyrical stuff. Um, but then when it's a, a more, you know, enigmatic or, you know, animated piece of music, I can take the David Charles and, and find the music within the notes where you know read between the lines so to say absolutely uh, hmm. when did you start when did you start bringing in scales and stuff like that long tones working on phrasing and stuff like that was that part of you know lessons with stephen cooper or was that uh as you are learning the cornet i think so I think there's a there's a progress to this. So, as a cornet player, I wouldn't have realised phrases. I didn't have that intellectual maturity to realise stuff like musicality and phrases. Everything, everything at that age was was by rote. So you'd be told how to play it, and you played it how it was sang to you. And it was only when I started to to get into the brass band world when I started lessons with Steve Cooper. When I when I sat next to a, a player called Smokey. Um, his real name's Ian Wright, but his nickname's Smoke, and he played for the Jaguar Land Rover Band on Principal Euphonia for, for many years. And he used to play with a band called the Yorkshire Building Society Band, who was led by David King. And now, anyone who knows me knows that I love Brighouse and Restrict, which is the band that David King conducts now. And I love um, YBS, Yorkshire Building Society, which doesn't exist anymore. And I think I spent a lot of time listening to those recordings and, and sitting next to smoking, trying to copy that musicality. And I think it splits into two. There's a third inner sense of musicality, which you get, which you just get by listening to music, by listening to those around you, by picking up stuff from players. But there's also, there comes an age when you're a bit older and you're more intellectually and more emotionally um, mature that you start to explore how you can shape lines. And I think, for me, there's there's an inner there's an inner feeling which I can't almost um, 
find the, the right words for, which if you put a piece of music in front of me, then I'll, I'll find that, that, that natural phrase on, that natural flow to the music, which, which will enable me to communicate that, that section of music. But it all, it all depends on, on the piece you're playing as well. So it's often and exciting, everything's fresh. We're always learning. Absolutely. And unfortunately, we have to uh, kind of uh, step aside right now. And we, we've we already had an inter this interview has, the conversation has been enjoyed for uh, quite a quite some time to where uh, I, I find myself in a really interesting uh, uh, position here uh, as I have started with the summit, an interesting way to where knowing my own capabilities and at this particular time, having to step aside and saying uh, the shortened interview process, the shortened or the smaller conversation snippets comparatively to like three hours and plus um, having to go pick up my kids from school is going to be taking precedent at this moment. And we will be able to catch up uh, uh, within uh, throughout the years that are to come, because um, this isn't going away anytime soon. I, I thought when I first started this euphonium summit, this whole idea, this, this, vision that I thought was going to be very limited and to seeing the response and the encouragement and from artists like uh, Micah and from around the world, really, um, this is not going to run out of steam anytime soon. Uh, and um, I, I thank you so much uh, for taking the shorter time um, and to create kind of little snippet chapters uh, and taking this idea that I have uh, and just recently thought of and to making it like an actual reality, even though uh, I didn't really think it was going to run to going to pick my kiddos up uh, at this point, which is totally fine. It shows that we're not perfect. And, you know, as much as we plan for things, they don't always seem to work out to where we think they're going to work out, but it always provides us an opportunity to uh, come up with creative solutions and finding ways to overcome certain obstacles. That sounds good. I'm looking forward to uh, to to sharing our next chapter together. Absolutely, absolutely. And with that being said, thank you so much, Michael, for joining us uh, and joining you. Uh, uh, who are whoever is watching these? Uh, please feel free to reach out if you've uh, gotten some impact in just his uh, short little snippet. This chapter of his uh, story that he's brought to us, um, and I had to cut it short just because of my kiddos uh, going forward. Um, this is a global, amazing, uh, amazingly epic journey that i'm i'm honored to share with you that are watching this those that are hearing it with micah and and if you haven't gotten a chance check out the hour plus conversation uh that was transcribed already um in uh your email pdf or you know grab a hard copy uh wherever whatever media that you utilize the best, I encourage you to pick it up. Uh, it's really something special beforehand uh, as it will be throughout uh, all our journeys together. Um, thank you so much, Micah. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to uh, catching up with you in the near future. Absolutely. Have a good one, everyone. Thank you. See you all later.